Hi, this is Dr. Rob C. Thompson bringing you five 19th century mediums you should probably know about. Our terms today are 19th century, and by that we're really talking about post-1848, when mediumship became a popular phenomenon in the U.S., uh, also in the U.K., and points further into Europe and Russia. And we are talking about uh, around 1880-1890 as the end point for the craze for mediumship, although there certainly are still mediums practicing all the way up to the present day. By mediums, we mean people who communicate with the spirits of the dead. Our list is chronological as far as we are able to order folks and not ranked. The Fox Sisters The Fox family, husband John, wife Margaret, and children Kate and Margaret, moved into their new home in Hydesville, New York, on December the 11th, 1847, and almost immediately began hearing mysterious tapping sounds throughout the house. On the 31st of March, the Foxes established contact with the Hydesville Wrappings as the sounds came to be called, and they set off a series of events that led to an international movement. Kate, between the ages of 9 and 12, we, we debate her actual age as well as her sister, sounded a series of taps with her knuckle, which were then repeated exactly by the mysterious taps. This prompted her older sister Margaret, who was between the ages of 11 and 15, to ask the taps to do as I do, count 1, 2, 3, to which the taps responded in kind. Following this first exchange, the Fox's neighbors gathered in the house, and the group proceeded to question the taps. The Fox's son David, a farmer who lived two miles from his parents' cottage, went alone into the cellar the third week of April and called over the alphabet in order to discover that the spirit belonged to a peddler who had been murdered in the house some years previous. By calling over the alphabet, we mean that he would say the letters of the alphabet one at a time and wait for a tapping sound to indicate that that was the next letter in the word he was forming, a very time-consuming way of communicating with the dead. The group dug according to the spirit's instructions and eventually turned up traces of human hair, quicklime, and fragments of hand and skull bones. Over time, the foxes concluded that Kate and Margaret were, in fact, mediating these otherworldly tapping sounds, and the girls became popular entertainers holding seances around the state and across the country. Newspaper publisher and presidential candidate Horace Greeley offered to put the girls through school, but their older sister Leah, who had become sort of like their manager, was reluctant to cut their career short. They decided that Kate would take Greeley's offer and Margaret, or Maggie, would continue to tour and commune with the spirits of the dead for audiences across the country. Maggie Fox would go on to a checkered and difficult career. She fell in love with the Arctic explorer Elisha Kent Kane, but his wealthy family disapproved of his match with a country girl turned supernatural celebrity. Kane's health suffered during an expedition to try and rescue the explorer Sir John Franklin, and he died shortly afterward. Fox claimed that they had been secretly married and called herself Mrs. Margaret Fox Kane ever afterward. Troubled by the emotional toll of childhood celebrity and the loss of Kane, Fox became an alcoholic. In 1888, she gave a performance in which she demonstrated to the rapt audience gathered at the New York Academy of Music that she'd made the famous Hydesville rappings with her toes. This didn't exactly explain all of the events decades earlier at the farmhouse where the taps would sometimes sound without either girl being present, most notably when son David called over the alphabet and found out where to dig for the body. It also didn't account for how she had fooled a variety of committees of investigators over the years, including one composed of Harvard professors who were somehow unable to guess this very simple explanation. In need of money, Maggie Fox recanted her confession and went back on the seance circuit. Today, Kate and Margaret are regarded as the founders of modern mediumship, although their history is decidedly fraught. Andrew Jackson Davis A year before the Fox sisters had their first exchange with the spirit of the peddler, Andrew Jackson Davis had visions predicting the rise of mediumship. Davis was born in a small town on the east side of New York State. 
In 1846, he began a series of lectures delivered in trance to friend and scribe William Fishbow, and in 1847, those lectures were published as the Principles of Nature. Having moved to the nearby city of Poughkeepsie, Davis's visions earned him the moniker the Poughkeepsie Seer, and his daily demonstrations were witnessed by many prominent New Englanders, including Albert Brisbane and Edgar Allan Poe. Originally surfacing as an unaffiliated visionary, when Davis realized the connection between his philosophy and the spirit manifestations that had begun to surface throughout the country, he paused from his philosophical meditations in the, his five-volume Great Harmonia to travel to the home of Eliakin Phelps in Stratford, Connecticut, where spirit manifestations attended a young boy and girl. By this point, spirit manifestations, much like the ones that had visited Kate and Margaret Fox, had begun to attend many children as well as young adults, particularly young women. From his experiences in Stratford, Davis developed a philosophy of spirit communication and mediumship that he published as The Philosophy of Spiritual Intercourse. This book effectively linked his prophetic vision into the wider spiritualist movement, In his philosophy, Davis outlined the need for a demonstration of the truth of immortality to an increasingly scientific and religiously deprived American culture. He argued that the recent advent of spirit communication had been brought on when a long-standing public fear of evil spirits was finally overcome by a much more general and powerful love of God. A Christian God, in Davis's view, who Davis contended was also the author of mediumship. He also identified the mechanics of mediumship, the material nature of spirits, and best practices for a seance or circle. Davis was the first American trance speaker, and his steady stream of published manuscripts reveals the way trance communication connected the wonder of spirit channeling with the development of a distinctly spiritualist philosophy. Cora Richmond Cora Richmond was born Cora Scott in 1840 near the town of Cuba in Allegheny County, New York. She spent most of her childhood in Wisconsin, where she moved with her family shortly after her birth. She discovered her mediumship when she fell into a trance state while writing on her lesson slate and composed a message from her mother's deceased sister. Soon afterward, Richmond began channeling the spirit of a German physician, and people from around the state converged on her father's house for medical treatment. She began trance speaking in 1851 when she was only 11 years old. At 14, she became a regular speaker for a spiritualist society in Buffalo, New York, and at 17, she made a major tour of the country. Richmond was one of the most successful trance speakers of her day. Her performances were given on a community stage. They were also given at concert halls and in theaters. After a short introduction, often including a prayer and hymn, Richmond would take center stage, channeling one or more spirits, who would then proceed to address the crowd. Her most frequent possessing spirits were the American Indian Nuina and her spirit mentor Baloo. Usually, this central lecture that she gave was followed by a question-and-answer session, and a jury would decide whether they believed that the medium, in this case Cora Richmond, was in fact inspired by voices from the other world. The topics chosen for trance lectures tended to be scientific, chemistry, for example, or physics, naturalism, or even agriculture, or they could be philosophical. In any case, the belief was that the topic was theoretically beyond the medium's knowledge and intellectual capacity. Imagine Richmond as a young 17-year-old being asked complex philosophical or chemical questions. One of Richmond's most famous converts was James J. Mapes, a chemist and agricultural inventor who received, in his words, marvelous scientific answers to the questions that Mapes put to Richmond. If the medium could demonstrate a knowledge beyond her perceived intellectual ability, this amazed her audience and tended in their eyes to prove her mediumistic ability. It was unusual for women to be able to speak publicly in the 1850s and 1860s, and Richmond and her fellow trance mediums were part of a larger movement to advance women's voices in Western culture. Although audiences tended to think of mediums as empty vessels, Richmond tried to garner some spiritual authority for herself. 
She said that while her body was possessed, she would visit the spirit world where she was educated on the higher principles of religion and spirituality. This education allowed Richmond to gradually advance a program that acknowledged the existence of a feminine aspect of the divine. Daniel Dunglass Hume One of the most sensational physical mediums of all time was the Scottish-born American medium Daniel Dunglass Hume. Daniel Hume entered public life in 1851, three years after the Fox sisters, and fast became one of the most popular mediums of the period. He was born near Edinburgh, Scotland on March the 20th, 1833. His mother was rumored to have also possessed mediumistic powers, but for reasons that Hume never divulged, he was raised by an aunt. He came to America at the age of nine and had his first substantial spiritual experience at 13 when the ghost of a dead friend who had passed only three days before visited Hume in bed. He was asked to leave his house at 18 because his aunt objected to the spirit tapping that was attending him, and after four years touring New England, he boarded a boat for Europe. He was raised as a member of the middle class. Although he performed for some of the crowned heads of Europe and collected significant stores of jewelry from his patrons, Hume never appears to have become a person of substantial means. One of the primary reasons for this might be that he never collected money for any of his seances, nor sold any of his jewelry. He lived off of a system of patronage whereby his hosts invited him to perform in their parlors in an implied exchange for food and lodging. His seances are widely described as some of the most fantastic of the era, although they were not consistent. On the 10th of February, 1856, the spirits absented themselves from Hume's life and returned exactly a year later, as they had promised him, on the 10th of February, 1857. During this year off, Hume was converted to Catholicism by the Pope himself in Rome. Hume almost always began his seances by gathering his participants around a table and having each member place his or her hands on the table. Viscount Adair, a close confederate of Hume's and attendee at over 70 of his seances, recorded a series of superhuman feats achieved by the medium with spiritual assistance, including elongating his body, handling hot coals, and levitating. Occasionally, Hume was even able to cause these phenomena to occur in other participants at his seances, in one instance making a young woman become palpably elongated to the extent of perhaps three inches. The phenomenon most associated with Hume were his disembodied spirit hands, which would hover and tap on sitters' shoulders. And in his greatest and most controversial feat, Hume floated out of a third-story window and in again at another window, levitating in the open air above a London street. Hume was investigated by the chemist William Crookes, who believed Hume's phenomenon to be genuine, but Crookes had infamously botched investigations of the mediums Florence Cook and Anna Ava Fay, both of whom had been caught faking in other contexts. The poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning was also deeply impressed by Hume's phenomena, but her husband Robert Browning was not and wrote a scathing satire accusing Hume of fraud. His spirit hands have been variously explained as stuffed gloves, sculpted replicas, or a product of rubbing phosphorescent oil on his own hands. Most explanations center on the fact that Hume performed in dim light, but the dramatic nature of many of his feats suggests that more is required to fully explain his mediumship away as faking. Hume retired from his seances during the rise of full-form mediumship, that is to say, the rise of mediumship in which full spectral bodies were produced, often from inside closets or cabinets, and he retired in 1871. He suffered from tuberculosis throughout his life and died in 1886. Emma Harding, Britain As a child, Emma Harding Britton had intended to be an opera singer, but her aspirations were dashed when she began to scream herself hoarse during what she described as somnambulist night wanderings. She turned to the piano, studied composition, and eventually ended up on stage performing as an actress at the Adelphi in London. She attracted the interest of Ethelbert Marshall from the Walnut and Broadway theaters and left for New York in August of 1855 for what was supposed to be a six-month engagement. 
According to Britain's own account, she was well-liked by the American public, but not by the Broadway's management. Despite enjoying some minor success with a series of little character pieces that she wrote for herself, Britain was slotted into insignificant roles and eventually shelved. Around this time, some of Britain's actor friends in New York brought her to a medium on Canal Street. The medium revealed to Britain that Britain had mediumistic talents herself, and she began experimenting, conducting her own seances in her boarding house. After receiving her mother's approval, she began giving free seances in rooms gifted to her by the merchant Horace Day, and in 1857 she took up the call to become a trance performer, eventually making her way around the English-speaking world. As a founding member of Helena Blavatsky and Henry Steele Alcott's Theosophical Society, Britain saw the potential for spiritualists to embrace a broader hierarchy of otherworldly beings beyond the spirits of the dead. She had written an article in the Banner of Light in which she argued for the existence of kobolds or earth spirits, which she personally encountered at an English miner's house. In her teenage years, Britain had worked as a mesmeric subject for a mirror-gazing circle that likely included writer, member of parliament, and occultist Edward Bulwer-Lytton. After successfully establishing herself as a trance medium, Britain turned to her European occult roots when she published a series of books written by the Chevalier Louis de B. The Chevalier, who may or may not have been Britain herself, described how he had started his career in a mirror-gazing circle and had gone on to become initiated in a secret society of occult adepts in India and learn the secret to conscious control of otherworldly beings. This was in contrast to spirit mediums who channeled their spirits unconsciously. These books caused an uproar among the spiritualist community, who believed there were no other supernatural beings other than the spirits of the dead, and Britain eventually distanced herself from her chevalier. Britain's other major contributions to spiritualism were her History of the Rise of Mediumship, Modern American Spiritualism, published in 1870, and her Chronicle of Mediumistic and Supernatural Phenomena Around the Globe, 19th Century Miracles, published in 1884. These books continue to serve as important references for the dates, figures, and events of the rise of the movement. And that's five 19th century mediums you should probably know. Thanks for listening.